I am a grand council member at the Indigenous Performing Arts Alliance. And it's my honor to welcome you all to this very special information session with the Ontario Arts Council. A quick reminder for everyone to please make sure your camera and microphone is turned off during the session. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the chat function to share. Before we start, I would also like to take a moment for all of us in your heart and minds to acknowledge and to pay respect to the land and the Indigenous caretakers of the territory you are on. Before we welcome our speakers, I would like to introduce our elder, Kat Krieger. Kat Krieger is an Indigenous elder, traditional teacher, and knowledge keeper. He is from the Cayuga Nation Turtle Clan, as well as having some German and English ancestry. He has worked as an elder and advisor in many Indigenous agencies and was a recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for his work speaking to diversity, equity, respect for women, anti-racism, and anti-oppression. Kat's focus and vision for life is to help build a world based on intercultural and interfaith dialogues, which he believes will require trusting relationships and strong bridges between all cultures. Please join me in welcoming our elder for this session, Kat Krieger. Miigwech, uh, Jimmy Gretch. So I'd like to start off um, by remembering the elder that uh, spent so many years teaching me. His name was uh, Zawewe Gabo. And I always remember his words um, and have simply changed a bit of that to include my name. So. Sego Tanse Wenabosho, Makpagish Gadden Dishnikas, Jikan Dodam, Kyuban Dunjaba, Mima German English and Da, Ambe Manja Da, Jibabi Da Ben, Genegay Gomi Nagay Nagay Goba. So Miguet Scobini Que, Mima Manado Gisus, Manado Nokmus, Mima Gitchmi Mede Wabo, Mimi Shaganash Shubangi. So I have to say right off, I don't speak Ojibwe very well. My elder was Ojibwe. I'm Keyugan Haudenosaunee. So that was an interesting mix to uh, walk through many years together. And I'm also German English. So in recognizing all those things, I like to recognize all my ancestors because if any of that DNA was missing, I would not be here today. So that's important to me. And uh, again, I admit I do not speak Ojibwe very well, but those are the words as I kind of remember them. And they mean a lot to me inside. Part of it talks about uh, recognizing the sun for coming up. And when I when I in, interpret that uh, philosophically, it's you know, that sun rising in the east, traveling across the sky and setting in the west. And it reminds us each and every day, so we, we have no chance to forget how we're supposed to be as people, that we're supposed to walk through life, we're supposed to bring light, bring warmth, and bring life to everything around us. And that's uh, an essential, essential part of our journey, that I recognize the moon for that beautiful symbiotic dance it does with the sun. It's share that light together and that moon softens that light into that silver glow and shines down earth. And uh, just like our grandparents, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, they, they, that moon always has the same face turned towards earth. Even though the earth is spinning, um, the earth's going around the sun, the moon's going around the earth and it's spinning around, it manages to always have the same face towards earth. And that's really unique. So that, that silver light and that silver hair blend together in that. I also acknowledge the big water to the south of us, from where I am up in Brampton area right at the moment. Uh, that big water to the south of us um, is so beautiful and recognize that it's essential for life. So all these components, uh, that, that philosophy, that carrying, that uh, passing on of uh, ancient knowledge from the ancestors, the uh, essentials of life, that water, the land, all that's around us that is so important. And of course, when I think of the land that we're on, um, you know, the, the, the peoples that have lived in this land in the past, the Winda, the Huron, the um, you know, Seneca, Haudenosaunee, Pinto, Neutral, and countless tribes uh, 
from way back in time, what is called time, I guess, that semi-linear thing that we look at every now and then. And of course, uh, the signatories of the treaties in this area that we're standing on, the Mississaugas of the Credit. And uh, this, this land that we have a responsibility to take care of, all of us. So that's, that's important as well. I guess more about those words, um, just because that water is essential. And in the last number of days, we've seen the water travel all the way from the lake to come and touch us and remind us how close it is and that we can always reach out and touch or be touched by what is essential for life when we try. So I also want to start with a smudge, a virtual smudge. So I was a little bit shy about doing virtual smudges at first or all the technology because, you know, I've been to, I've been to ceremonies where even an electric lighter or using a Bic lighter was, I don't say frowned on, but everything was old style. There was a fire, there was an ax, there was, uh, you know, food was cooked over the fire. Of course, things have changed nowadays. And so using this virtual technology is, is where we are at the moment. And even using a, a lighter, um, you know, one day somebody said to me, you know, we don't use that technology, we use matches. I thought, well, and I mentioned, I said, well, we didn't even have matches until the newcomers showed up. And it was quite a laugh at the time, a bit of humor. But I want to light this smudge. I have some Northern Sage here. Um, and I, I really wish we could all be in the circle to share. But I also like to think that spirituality, um, these ceremonies, they don't recognize physical borders. They don't recognize distance. They don't recognize time that they can travel out to each and every one of us. So I'll, I'll take that time. And the smell is beautiful, by the way. I think uh, technology needs to catch up a little bit more so we can pass on that scent to everyone. And uh, that metaphoric washing of the hands, taking some of our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth, breathing a little bit in, letting it touch our heart. And to me, that kind of translates into everything I touch, everything we touch today, we're going to touch with our hearts. When we think, we're going to think with our hearts. When we look at things, we're going to look at them with our heart. When we speak, it's going to come from our heart. And very importantly, when we listen to each other, we're going to listen with our heart. And I think if we listen to each other with our hearts, then everything goes into that. Um, what my son used to call his dream catcher was his heart was a dream catcher. That he liked the idea that it would take in good things and let bad things go away. And it was interesting that when he was a young boy, he mentioned that uh, while we were doing uh, a memorial ceremony. He came up with that. He goes, my heart is a dream catcher. He goes, it's, it's going to let good things stay there and bad things go by or, or disappear because I don't want to carry around bad things, negative, negative things in my heart. So that dream catcher that is our heart, I think that works well when we listen with our heart. So all things through that filter. And I, I like to think sometimes, uh, um, you know, I almost dream of going to the UN and smudging the whole assembly and, and talking about that idea that uh, our heart is a dream catcher, that we all need to listen to one another with our hearts. So when we gather in a circle, um, when we share that smudge together, and we're all looking into the center and that at that center we can um, you know, we can see that fire we each have a different place in the circle that we're looking from and if we share our knowledge and wisdom all the way around the circle and we're each getting each other's perspectives and i like to think and um, i'm also an artist myself there's, there's assorted art things that i just love to do and um, i love painting i love photography i love video I love viewing and seeing art because it speaks to me. And I find it's another thing that you kind of have to look at and view with your heart or feel with your heart. So we, we gather like this, we have that opportunity to share knowledge. And you know, even, even the things that are around here, um, the words that we bring, the, the ideas that we bring, and the inspiration. I had a, um, a very ancient, sorry, very, very elderly uh, Chinese man that taught me brush painting when I was younger. And one of the things he said that was each and everything that we experience and see as we walk through our life, that's what comes out in our art. And it can be all kinds of things that you want in different manifestations, be it um, visual or, or sound or spoken or, or physical, um, whether it's murals or dance or painting or sound. All those things, that's, that's that accumulation of what we feel and, and what we see in life. 
And I think the opportunity to pass on that knowledge, it sometimes requires a venue. It sometimes requires substance. It sometimes requires uh, help. I, I guess when we, when, when we walk through this life and want to express ourselves through art, that's also a special thing. Not, not everybody speaks that language, I guess, but it's an easy translation. And I love to think uh, that, you know, old style we hunted, um, we harvested, we went out to find things, we went out to uh, hunt, uh, to pick things, we went out fishing, we went out collecting medicine. And all, the, all those things were what we needed to sustain ourselves. And then I think as, as human history evolved and moved along, we realized that, um, I'm speaking metaphorically that we needed something besides us to sustain ourselves. I like to think that each one of us is made up of mind, body, spirit, mind, body, spirit, mind, body, spirit. When those three things are braided together, they make for a, a beautiful, strong braid, much like the braids of sweet grass that we have. They're braided of three components. So that's, that's almost my mindset on that philosophy that if those three things are strong, if they're in balance, and if they're braided together nicely, it makes something that's visually appealing. That's very beautiful. It's very flexible. And when it comes to like the braid in our hair, then it's very strong. And I like to start my day off with that where I, um, you know, I get up in the morning, I get cleaned up and I braid my hair. And I like to try and think mind, body, spirit, mind, body, spirit, mind, body, spirit while I'm braiding my hair. And that's my kind of my morning uh, meditation. When I think about what sustains us, what keeps us alive, what gives us time, when all those things are met, what we need to be um, healthy and living, when all those criteria are met, then we have some other time. We have some time to express ourselves. We have times for our storytelling. We have times for our songs. We have times for our, for our, our art. And I think part of that is inter, interbraided, sorry, braided into our culture as well. You know, from the time um, art's been around a long time since man first walked upright, since humans first walked upright. Um, you know, when we started with those cave paintings, with marks on rocks, with drawings in the sand, with uh, additions to our, our required clothing or garments, um, to our hair or our body, all those things come together. And that's kind of, um, that's kind of what I see sometimes in that that end result that is art, that gathering that is art. It's almost like, to me, it's like a, a, a sacred circle developed in a different way. Again, it might be painting, it might be dance, it might be spoken word, it might be a song, it might be any of those things. But it's almost like a circle coming together an expression of what is in the heart, what is in our, our, our spirit. For me, that's pretty amazing. So as, as a traditional person, as a Euro-Western person, as an artist person, I see all those things being braided together. When we went hunting and uh, when we looked for something to sustain ourselves, you know, we, we took our quiver, we took our, our fishing line, we took our paraflex to put things in the, the, a bundle, maybe to carry stuff, something to harvest with, all those things. Um, and we, we hunted animals, we harvested food, we fished the lakes, um, uh, we dug the plants, etc. All those things were necessary. Our hunt is a little bit different nowadays. One of the things we need to sustain ourselves, and maybe kind of one of the points that we'll be talking about today is, today we need to hunt for funding. That's one of the things we need to sustain ourselves. We're still hunters. I, I, I like to think of it that way. We are still hunters. And that when we do that, that skill set of hunting sometimes requires knowledge to be passed on from the ancients, knowledge to be passed on from our elders knowledge to be passed on from people who carry that information and understanding of how to hunt. So two levels here. One is, one is that ancient thing, one is that present day thing. We need to know where our game is. We need to know where it is that we're hunting. And I think a lot of the information shared today is going to point out, here's, here's the game, here's where to harvest, here's what we're hunting, here's, how to, here's the skill sets you need to, um, to take your game, to uh, catch your fish, to dig the plants, all those things. So that's kind of a, a, a weird and, and maybe a strange metaphor braided together with a traditional view on what we're doing. 
And I like to think also that when you come to a circle and you come to a gathering, who wants to share that knowledge and wisdom, they're giving you a gift. In a sense, they devoted much of their time, in some cases, much of their life, uh, to acquiring that knowledge so they can pass it on to you. So we have another sharing of gifts. And it seems that the sharing of gifts from people with knowledge about how to find what it is to need to complete the task that you've picked up or complete the art that you're doing, there's that ongoing, almost a pay forward of gifts. And one gift leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And I think uh, when we walk this world, when we want to express ourselves, there, there's such a, I know for myself, if I, if I paint a painting or, or do a little video or take a picture, there's a desire to express something. And the first person that often sees that is myself. So many of us, when we do that, we see the first vision in our mind, we see the first manifestation of it in our work, and then we want to share it with others. And that appreciation goes back two ways. So it's a wonderful circle of gift giving, and it's a wonderful circle of sustainability. I think today is gonna to be very important. It's gonna set many people off on a journey. And I wish everybody a very safe journey. And when I see those things to hunt, you know, I'm re reminded of a movie, uh, of all things, for some reason that just popped into my mind when the, the village and the hunters are, are waiting and somebody rides into the village and they're shouting, Tatanka, Tatanka, Buffalo, Buffalo are here. And everybody jumps up and runs and gets ready, but everything's in place with what they need to, to do their task. When they realize that the buffalo have arrived or are going through, now the hunt begins. So maybe in humor, funding is our present day buffalo. And that uh, I'm really wishing everybody a very good hunt and that when you walk this path that you take with you the, the gifts of sustainability, the gifts of the environment that we're going to work in. And whoops, sorry, lost me for a second. The buffalo are shaking the floor. So. I think that's all the words I want to share because I can't learn anything while I'm talking and I really want to hear what everybody else has to say. So I'm, I'm going to leave it there for a minute and sit back and, and listen. So in the words of my son, all done. Miigwech. Niawa, miigwech. Thank you, Cat Krieger, for opening this space. Uh, just a reminder, once again, please turn off your audio and video and to share any questions that you have in chat. Now, please welcome our first speaker, Maura Broadhurst from the Ontario Arts Council, who will be discussing the new Arts Response Initiative. Welcome, Maura. Thanks so much, Barb, and thank you to uh, IPA for allowing the OAC to have this space with all of you today. It's a real privilege to, to sit in our virtual circle together and, and have a chance to, to connect this way. Um, and thank you absolutely to Elder Kat Krieger. Thank you so much for sharing your words and, and your experiences. I will think about uh, many of the things that you've shared, including to, to speak and to, to listen with our hearts today. Um, I want to also begin just by telling you a little bit about myself. I have been at the, an officer at the Ontario Arts Council for about a nine years, nine years now in a variety of positions. So there's, I've worked in quite a few of our programs, so I'm happy to be a contact for you if you're trying to navigate through our systems and trying to find the right place for you, if that, if that's comfortable for you. Um, prior to that, I was a curator and educator working in, in art galleries in different parts of Southern Ontario. Uh, at the Ontario Arts Council, uh, we acknowledge that Indigenous peoples are the original occupants of this land, and the OAC supports the significant ongoing contributions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis artists in all regions of the province. Um, through an, we have a number of programs and initiatives where we try to do that. Uh, we also support the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the Calls for Action, and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And we are committed to fostering the strength and diversity of Indigenous art forms, practices, and cultural expressions. 
I'm going to share my presentation with you today so that you can follow along as I'm speaking. Um, so I'm going to try and do that now. So bear with me for a moment. So Sergio, I think you need to let me share. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can see um, a screen that says agenda at the top. Someone can let me know if you don't. Um, uh, on that agenda, you can see I'm going to just a few things that we're going to talk to you about. I'm going to share a little bit about uh, the OAC in general, in case any of you are not familiar with us and our work. Uh, I will then go on to speak about the Arts Response Initiative, our new program. My colleague, Alana Forslin, will speak about the Northern Arts Projects, and we'll together be speaking about some of our um, uh, general assessment processes and, and some tips for you. We will definitely have time after each section for some uh, questions. So uh, if you could wait to those moments, but if you do have a question you don't want to lose, you could put it in the chat so that we make sure that we can capture that. So the Ontario Arts Council is the Arts Funding Agency of the Province of Ontario. Um, we are there to support the creation, presentation, production of arts by all artists in the province. And we're also there for the public, uh, the audiences, to ensure that Ontarians have access to arts in their community. We have a series of granting programs that are available to people um, that we've grouped into four granting streams. So creating and presenting, building audiences and markets, engaging communities and schools, and developing careers and arts services. Within those streams, there are uh, different kinds of programs and a number of them are there for individual artists to apply to, some are there for collectives and groups to apply to, and others for um, established not-for-profit arts organizations. So we have grants for all those different kinds of applicants. And depending on what program you're interested in, it would be important to pay attention to who is eligible, who is allowed to apply to any of those programs. Uh, if we have time later, I might take you to our website just to walk you through where you can find the different programs. Uh, but all of these obviously are available on our website. At the Ontario Arts Council, we have identified what we call uh, six priority groups, and I've listed them here for you. So Indigenous artists, artists of colour, Francophone artists, deaf artists and artists with disabilities, new generation artists and artists living in regions outside of Toronto. So these are all groups of artists uh, who for different reasons, historically and still today, have faced barriers in accessing public funding for their art making or their art presentations. So most of these priority groups have specific programs that we have specifically for members of those communities. So uh, it, we have a series of Indigenous arts programs that only Indigenous artists or Indigenous groups are allowed to apply to. That doesn't mean those are the only ones you're eligible for. You are eligible at, uh, for any of the ones at the Ontario Arts Council, but those ones are specifically for Indigenous artists, for example. And one of the key differences also is that they are assessed by other Indigenous artists. So the people making the decisions about who gets a grant would also be Indigenous artists in those cases. Um, in addition, all of our juries, so our, our grants are all decided upon by a jury of peers. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in all of our juries, we ask our juries to think about whether an applicant is a member of a priority group and uh, just to keep that in mind, to remember that there are reasons why we've made them priorities at the OAC and uh, to think about that as they're reading applications and, and making their decisions, to remember the context in which those individuals or those groups are applying to the OAC.
So in March, when the pandemic hit uh, our region, um, we heard from many, many people very quickly about all the, the challenges and struggles they were facing in creating their art or trying to continue their arts practice. Uh, we reached out to many to hear what was you know what was going on throughout the province, what were the challenges, what did people need in terms of financial support. Uh, after we, you know, then thought about it a lot and looked at our programs and tried to ensure that our programs allow for different kinds of activities, activities that maybe are a little bit different than they used to be, making sure that um, we weren't inadvertently making something ineligible in our programs, but we still felt that there was a need for a specific kind of um, support to help people overcome barriers they were facing because of COVID-19. So we created this program, the Arts Response Initiative. We've redirected fun, funds that are in our budget that are from other programs, programs that primarily support travel. And um, from those programs, we've put together a, a, a pocket of money to support um, projects that will be uh, awarded through this arts response initiative. So projects do have to be in direct response to the challenges that you are facing because of COVID-19, um, but they can be sort of uh, projects can be quite short term in their uh, approach or in their impact, I guess, or medium, or they could be really looking to the long term. Um, the, the activities can range um, depending on your situation and depending on what you're trying to achieve, but it's to allow you to carry out your future uh, arts activity. So it's not to, to support you in the creation or presenting of, of new work. That's already something that we fund in our other programs and I'd be happy to direct you to those. So it's not for that. It's to get you to a point where you can create again or so that you can present your work uh, because perhaps right now, there's obstacles that are stopping you from doing that. And we'll get into some examples of that in a bit too. The projects that you can think about can be very practical um, or they can be a little bit experimental. Maybe there's um, some, you, this is a, th this moment that we've all been living through has caused you to think about maybe um, getting back into it in a, in, in a new or in a different way because, because you have to, because you have to think about your art making maybe in a little bit of a different way. So it can be a little bit of an experiment. It, you don't need to know exactly how it's gonna play out or how, exactly what it will result in. There's, there's room for um, trying. And you know, with that, it might work. We all hope it will, of course, but it might not and that's okay. So the program has three streams is what we're calling it. Um, one for individual artists, one for groups, collectives and organizations, and one for what we're calling organizational partnerships. And I'm going to um, go into each of these briefly. There's lots more information on our website about each of these. And of course you can connect with us directly if you have specific questions even after today. So the first one I'll talk about is the one for individuals. And this is a, um, a, a grant that is a fixed amount, which means if you get the grant, you receive $4,000, no more, no less. <laughs> so those who receive it will get $4,000. It has a deadline of October 20th and all of, the all of the programs at the Ontario Arts Council have a deadline of 1 p.m. on that deadline day. You do have to apply through our online system. Um, and so it is a machine and it, will sh it shuts off at 1 p.m. So uh, there's, it is important to make sure you leave yourself enough time for all of our programs. So this is a program for professional artists um, and curators who live in Ontario and it's, we're doing this kind of strange little loopy thing where you have to be eligible in one of our other programs to be eligible here. So, but generally speaking, if you're an artist, um, whether you're a visual artist or a dancer or a, a filmmaker um, or a writer, uh, any of the disciplines that we uh, support, uh, you would want to look at, for example, if you are a writer, you'd want to look at our literature programs and ensure that you're eligible there if you've never applied to us before. If you've applied to us before, um, and, and even if you haven't gotten a grant, but as long as you were eligible, then you're eligible in this program. 
the term professional artist is, is such a funny one and one we often get a lot of questions about what does it mean to be a professional artist and it's not an easy question to answer. It doesn't necessarily mean that you you know, have a certificate that says so, although maybe you have, maybe you have studied and do have a certificate in a particular discipline or have gone to different kinds of um, taking courses and things like that but it doesn't have to be that you can be uh, other things that we look at are um, have you worked at this discipline and have you tried to learn and that could be by yourself you could be self-taught it could be that you've learned from uh, peers or <laughs> from an elder um, so there's many different ways that you could have been uh, sort of have have um, become some kind of expert in that area that you have chosen to work on it is we we think about things like do other artists think you're a professional artist um, and do you try to to be financially compensated for your work we all know that in uh, this country it's very challenging to make a living off of your art maybe some of you do that's wonderful um, but at least you you seek payment for your work um, that it isn't just a hobby for you. It isn't something you just take pleasure in, which is a wonderful thing too, but that's not a professional artist. So those are some of the things that might help you, uh, th uh, help, help you understand what we mean by professional artists. Um, Alana, you may have other things you want to add when, it's, when you speak too. Uh, also, elders and, and language and knowledge keepers who are engaged in an artistic practice um, in Ontario are also eligible in this program. The application for this program is quite straightforward. It's two questions. Who are you? You know, give us a little bit of information about you. And in that question, we're going to, we, we're hoping you will also tell us a little bit about uh, what your experience during COVID has been and why your artistic practice has been interrupted during this time. Uh, so what were, what are the barriers you've experienced during this time that is stopping, well, either like it may not be preventing you entirely, but that are giving you problems in creating your art, whatever what, whatever kind of art you do. And the second question is, what do you want to do with these funds? So what is it that you're going to do to try to overcome those barriers? So it's just those two questions. And it's um, uh, we're asking for a resume or, or a biography. So, so the jurors who are going to be assessing your application can find out a little bit more about your professional activity. And that's it. So you because it's a, um, a fixed grant amount, there's no budget that you have to fill in. You have to tell the jury a little bit about what you're going to do with that money, with the $4,000. But it doesn't doesn't need to be outlined in a, in a budget per se. Um, so we've tried to keep it quite straightforward uh, for people so that it's, it's, it's not too burdensome, we hope. So that's that program or that stream. The next one is for groups, collectives, and organizations. The deadline is November 3rd, again at 1 p.m. And these grants are, can be up to $15,000 and there is a budget required. So you would lay out what, what your needs are in terms of the budget and, and then based on that, how much you're requesting from the Ontario Arts Council up to $15,000. Um, and in this case, it's, as I've said, there, here are some of the um, uh, specifics on the screen about uh, who is eligible um, and this would be for uh, if you're a group of artists who work together to do something uh, for you as a group same kind of idea what are the barriers you've experienced as a group maybe it's because you haven't been able to actually be together to do your work maybe you've been and need to continue to be separated and that makes it difficult for you to do your work so maybe in order to do that you um, need to all have better computer setup or you need an internet connection that you didn't have before or you need a better camera or you know so that you are allowed to ask for in this category up to five thousand dollars for equipment if that's something that you need um, maybe it's you have to work in a different kind of way because you can't connect with your audience right now maybe the gallery where you used to sell your work is closed right now and so you have to maybe connect with your the potential buyers or people who want to look at your work differently and again you need to set yourself up maybe with some equipment but maybe also you need to ha have someone 
teach you how to do that part. Maybe you've never had to do that part before because you always had a, a gallery or somebody else to, to help you with that. So you could use the funds to pay somebody to help you with that. You can pay yourself for that time that it takes to learn those new skills that kind of thing. Um, if you're an organization, it may be that your staff is off-site and again, they need some, some equipment upgrades or you're going to be starting um, to come together again and work in the office space that you have, but your office space is not uh, safely set up for a COVID world. So you need to redesign your office. Maybe you need to build some barriers, that kind of thing. That would be something you could apply for here. Um, I'm sure people have many more ideas than that, but that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. And then the final stream is organizational partnerships. Again, a November 3rd deadline. And this is a bigger uh, grant, so it is up to $30,000. The main applicant has to be a not-for-profit arts organization um, or an Ontario-based um, for-profit book or periodical um, publishers. And they have to identify at least one partner. The partner can be another arts organization or it could be um, uh, uh, another industry entirely. It, so it could be another arts group of some sort, uh, maybe a few in your community that want to come together and work on a project together, or it could be you're going to do something with a, a group in the health sector or the, a, a groups in education system or in the private sector. It's, it's, it's very open that way. But the idea would be, again, to look at what, and it, this one is a little bit more outwardly looking. You're not so much helping yourself. It might help you too, but it's really looking at the arts community and saying, um, I'm seeing that, you know, this is the, a big problem in the arts community right now because of COVID and we want to do this activity to help the artists in our community and the community might be regional, the community might be cultural, the community might be um, within your discipline, it could be all sorts of things but where you're looking you've identified some issues that are happening because of COVID and you're maybe it's you're going to be just doing some research about how to overcome that but it, you're sharing it among many people or many groups or maybe you do have a service you maybe you, you've said you know what everybody around here needs some training on how to post their things online now so instead of everybody trying to do it by themselves we'll organize a program for that and offer it to the community that kind of thing perhaps um, and I just want to run that through what were the priorities of the program before we move on to any questions um, in for all of the three streams in the program um, the, and if you're an applicant from one of our six priority groups, that will be taken into consideration. Uh, we will also be uh, looking at what we're calling anybody who's experienced significant barriers to continuing their practice because of COVID. So it will be important for all applicants to really tell the jury in their application what their experience has been over the last six months what what has been challenging for you as an artist or as an arts group to doing your work and what is it that you think will help you get to a place where you can once again be practicing and then we have uh, that third bullet projects that have the potential to benefit the applicant's career in the long term so it's completely fine if this is something that you just need right now to get over this hump and then go back to normal but maybe this is getting you thinking about a, a slightly new way of working or th or you're going to be training yourself and you're going to now have new skills that you will have forever that kind of thing is something that the jury will be thinking about as well and then just for uh, applications from organizations, we're also going to be looking at what kind of a role your organization has in the community. Um, and it's, you know, if you're, if you play a really critical role in your community and, but you just have this one, you know, area that you need help with, you need, everybody needs an upgraded system or something like that, but without it, you just can't do your work very well. And therefore you're not serving the community. You're not being able to play that, that critical role that you have in the community. Maybe you're really great at bringing artists together and, and, and serving them, but right now that's a challenge for you. So that's something they'll look at. And finally, um, any projects that yes benefit you that of course but that 
will be of a benefit to others as well is something that they will look at. So perhaps you're, you know, you're going to do some research into how to safely um, put on a dance performance in your community now. Um, and so you're going to do that work and maybe you're going to pay someone to work with you. You're going to pay yourself for that time. You're going to put together maybe a little bit of a document of that or I don't know what you're going to, whatever you do with your findings, your learnings, but maybe you share that with other groups in your communities or other dance uh, groups or something like that. So these are all the kinds of activities that the fund will uh, support if, it, you know, depending on what you want to do. So some research and planning, documenting your work, upgrading your technology, including your website, or if you don't have a website and now you think you really need one, the development of a website, uh, developing your skills on whatever area that you need to. Um, if you have to do some marketing that you never used to have to do, or you have to do it differently, that kind of thing. And again, adapting your workspace if that's what you need. Maybe, you know, you used to go to a, a shared studio and because of personal situation because of COVID, you can't go there anymore. So now you have to work at home, but you need a few tools and you need, or you need a, you know, a, a proper space at home to work that would be eligible. And I've already kind of reviewed this a little bit about what would be included in your application. Um, and yes, when we go, I'll talk about how the jury will think about it. So the, for the individuals, the juries are just going to look at the merit of the project. So what is your what is your challenge and what is your proposing, proposal to overcome that? For groups and organizations, it's a little bit more. They're going to look at that merit, but they're going to look at the impact of that project and they're going to look at the viability of the project. So does the budget make sense? Does the timeline seem to make sense? Things like that. So yeah, once the, at, after the deadline, we then look at the applications. We would pull together a jury. There'll be separate juries for the individual stream and for the organizations. Um, they will be other artists, um, but they will be artists of all disciplines. So, you know, you may have a, a, a dancer, an arts administrator, a, a writer, a visual artist around the table, you know, so just think about that a little bit while you're writing your application. Um, and they will be reading all the applications and then then uh, they'll come together to discuss them and choose which ones will be awarded based on your answers and based on looking at the purpose and the priorities of the program. So notification of the results is four months later. Uh, we'll do our best to do it maybe a bit more quickly, but for sure within four months. So that means, you know, for October 20th, that takes you to February 20th of next year. And for the November 3rd deadline, that'll take you till March 3rd. So you, you wouldn't be receiving the, the funds until that point if you are awarded a grant. That may be a good uh, space to pause. I have a few little tips here that we can talk about too, but I'm wondering, um, I'm not able to see the chat while I'm in this view. So I'm wondering if there are any, if, if there are any questions, if someone can maybe highlight that for me. Hey, Mara, it's Sergio. Thanks, Sergio. Uh, um, but folks, just a reminder, if you do have a chat, please feel free, uh, sorry, a question, please feel free to use the chat. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, I'll just keep going with, and these are some general tips that I would say apply to probably most, if not all of our programs, um, that if you're able to, you know, to go, if you're able to access our website and read through, uh, if you know what program you're interested in, reading through that, if you um, aren't sure, you're not sure how to navigate the website, you can call us, but certainly once you sort of think you know uh, what you want to do with the, your application, it's a great idea to call us and just talk about your project. We can help guide you a little bit and make sure that what you're thinking is, is eligible and appropriate for the program. Um, so again, when you're writing the ap application, remember you're writing to other artists. It's other artists that are going to be making this decision. So um, you don't have to think about it being, um, you know, uh, somebody who doesn't understand what the artistic practice is, they are going to understand. They may not understand, they may not be deeply involved in your practice, but, you know, they're going to understand your, your, the passion that you have for your work, which is the next one that you can speak in, you know, the first person you can tell us. In fact, it's, it's great to tell us your story and your, um, the, re the reasons why you want to do what, what you want to do.
if you're able to having somebody else read your application is always a good idea before you submit it sometimes we get so in our own head about our ideas and our projects we think something's really obvious but it's not obvious to everybody else that you have to you know maybe you've missed explaining an important part or something doesn't quite make sense or something like that that's a good idea i would say um, I put share the specifics of your contact so you know we're, we try very hard in our jury rooms not to compare applications because everybody's in a different situation and everybody's you know has a different history so tell us what yours is and, and that will help the jury understand your project um you do want to give enough detail that they can understand and sort of imagine your project but they also are going to have a lot of applications to read so you know if you've already told them something you don't need to tell them again um it uh, they they have a lot of work to do so be give them enough information but also try to be uh concise not to you know not not to make them read stuff they don't need to if you do have to fill in a budget, really think about what your expenses are. That'll help you come up with what your request amount should be and what revenue sources you need, if you do need other revenue sources. Um, give yourself lots of time to think about your application and to write it. Um, it's uh, amazing how quickly those deadlines come. Uh, if you're able to do a spell check, that's always helpful. Again, it's just helpful for the jury if, if they, if, when they're reading so much to be able to, uh, if, if they're stumbling over typos and stuff, that can be a little bit hard for them. And then in our case at the Ontario Arts Council, again, pay attention to the 1 p.m. deadline. So yeah, so um, if there aren't questions, um, maybe I'll stop sharing for a moment. Um, okay, I am realizing this is sort of a funny time to do this, but I'm real. Oopsie, sorry. I'm realizing I also neglected. I you're going to meet my colleague uh, Alana in a moment, but I also neglected to tell you that uh, another colleague from the Ontario Arts Council, Erica Eiserhoff, is also here with us today, just to, listening in with with everybody. Erica is the Indigenous Arts Officer. There she is. Hi, Erica. <laughs> um, who runs our uh, Indigenous Arts programs at the OAC? So um, those if. If you're not familiar with them those are uh, available to you too and and um, if you have questions about them you can connect directly with with Erica but maybe I'll leave it at that for now then Barb if we uh... okay well thank you Maura that, that was very informative um, up next we have Alana Forsland who will be discussing the upcoming Northern Arts Project Fund. So welcome, Elena. Okay, thanks, Barb. Um, so just before I get started, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Elena Frisland. I'm OAC's Northwestern representative. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm based in Thunder Bay, um, which is the traditional land of Fort William First Nation. Um, my ancestors are from Sweden and England, and I've been living in Thunder Bay for my whole life. I've been at OAC for about three and a half years now. It feels like I just started yesterday, but here I am three and a half years later. My role at the OAC is specifically to support artists in the north. Um, I'm an employee of the organization, but really I also work for arts communities in, in the north as well, and, and often all over. Um, I'm a bridge to programs. I, I want to help folks um, navigate our systems and, and help make our process a little more accessible. Just support folks every step of the way. I do a lot of outreach, so things like this. And when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, I also spend time directly in communities. And that's for me where a lot of my learning happens and I meet a lot of really, really great folks around the North. Um, my previous work, I am a visual and craft artist myself, and I also ran an arts education and community arts organization in, here in Thunder Bay. 
Um, particularly my focus while I was there was working with young people. I really um, have a strong passion for, for bringing arts to community. So that's just a little about me. And if folks wanna share about themselves in the chat while I'm talking, that's, that's totally great too. Um, so Maura, if you don't mind just pulling up the um, Northern Arts slides, if you're able to. Thanks. Okay, so just before I jump into the program information, I want to give a general overview of what we mean when we say Northern Ontario. I do get a lot of questions about it. Um, so our definition is quite broad. We have many varying arts ecosystems all over the North. We're looking at the three regions uh, that are on the map on the screen. Um, and for folks who can't see the screen, it's um, a map of Ontario. We have the far North, um, the northwest and the northeast are the three regions. It starts at the Manitoba border and moves all the way to the Nipissing and Perry Sound districts, as well as all things north of that. Um, to say, while I'm speaking, this, this program is specific to artists in Northern Ontario, but a lot of what I'm touching on in terms of activities that are supported we have many other programs that can that folks who aren't in the north can apply to so you, you may find it helpful to to hear some of this information. Um, just to say that like in the north our communities are all quite unique, but we do face similar challenges connected to creating presenting and accessing the arts up here shipping and travel costs are quite a bit higher and are often spread out geography means that we have varied access to learning opportunities um, outside of our communities. So this program was put into to place to kind of address some of those those challenges that we face in our communities. Again, you're eligible to apply if you live in Northern Ontario or your ad hoc group or collective or organization is based in the North. And I'll go a little bit deeper into what that means in just a minute. Um, the focus of the program is very broad. It's a very multidisciplinary program and multi-activity. It supports the creation, production, presentation of artwork, professional development for artists and community engaged arts initiatives for for Northern Ontario. Uh, a special thing that I like to always say is that the applications are also assessed by a jury of Northern Ontario artists, usually four or five people uh, part of that process. So they have an understanding of what it means to, to live up here. Um, and just a shout out to my colleague, Erica, who's on the call uh, and just, she's the program officer with this program. And I will, I, I'm looking at the chat, I'm seeing some questions coming in as well. So I'll try to speak to those uh, toward the end, I think, if that's okay. And Erica's just saying hello. Um, go to the, oh, and the deadline, the next deadline, sorry, is November 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We also have a spring deadline, uh, typically our current spring deadline passed, but it'll be hopefully again next year. Grant amounts range up to 15,000. Okay, next slide. Okay, so there are four categories with Northern Arts. They kind of echo uh, the four key funding focuses that OAC has that Maura spoke about earlier. When you're applying, uh, which is in NOVA through an online application system, you will choose one of these categories to apply to. Sometimes your activities might include more than one category, you might be thinking, oh, well, I'm making new work, but but there's an element of presentation to it. So just do your best to think about what the core focus of the, the work is and apply in that category. With new works, it focuses on the creation and production of new work in all artistic disciplines. So just some examples of what that might look like. It could be um, an artist applying to create a new series of paintings, maybe someone who's a bead worker who wants to produce a series of beaded images. It could be a band applying to record an album, a writer and an illustrator working together to create a graphic novel, or a collective of artists applying to create a mural. In presentation, we're looking at covering the costs of presenting artistic work. So things like typically exhibitions, um, singles and series presentations of art, concerts, literary readings, book fairs and festivals, as well as publications of work. 
in skills and career development, the focus of this one, oh, I'm skipping around, sorry. Um, skills and career development, the focus is to support artists to undertake some, some projects that will allow them to, um, to grow their skills. It can support individuals to participate in conferences, workshops, uh, things like seminars, short-term courses, mentorships, festivals or other similar learning opportunities. It can be local, it can be provincial, it can be national, it can be international. Um, for, the, for individuals, the learning can be formal training, just not post-secondary education, or it can be self-directed. So I do want to emphasize that. You can learn a new skill by spending time with mentors, with your community, with an elder. For organizations, uh, collectives and ad hoc groups, usually we'll see them presenting conferences, workshops, seminars or projects that'll benefit folks in, in the North. And, and with a focus again on career development. Sorry, Maura, could you jump back? I, I skipped around on my slide. There we go. Okay, the, the last category, which is the third on the screen is working with community. So that's really to help cover the costs of community engaged arts projects. That can be folks working in communities and schools, um, collaborations, residencies, Basically, initiatives that engage community members in a creative process that's led by artists, things like crafting circles, um, workshops in schools, um, you know, maybe it's an artist working in a, a long term care center with people to, to help them create something, those kinds of things are eligible. There's a real emphasis on collaboration in that category. Um, have the community members had input into the process? Have they thought about, has the artist thought about barriers to access? Um, all of those kinds of things. And I will touch just before we go to the next slide on eligible expenses as well. Um, it's again very broad, but typical expenses we see, this is an exhaustive list, things like artist fees. Um, so artists paying themselves and paying collaborators, that can be part-time or full-time. Uh, art supplies and shipping costs to make the project happen, elder and mentor honoraria, fees um, for workshops or learning opportunities, equipment rental, producer and production fees, that's usually for things like film or recording albums, uh, travel and transportation connected to the project, as well as things around accessibility, so ASL interpretation, as well as community access. So if you're running workshops, things like transportation costs, childcare, food, uh, anything you can do to make the, the project feel a little more available to the community. Now I'll jump to the next slide. Okay, so I'll go through this one quite quickly. Uh, the project or the program doesn't fund fundraising competitions and contests, major capital expenses, portfolios and promotional packages, self publishing with the exception of artist books, music videos with the exception of professional live documentation of performance as well as touring projects. And just to say we do have a program that supports touring. So you would look at applying to that one versus Northern Arts to support. The next slide. Okay, very quickly just sharing an, a quick overview of how the application is broken down. Mora has touched on a lot of this already. Essentially the assessors who are artists, they're reviewing and scoring your application based on artistic merit impact and viability. Um, so with artistic merit, thinking about sharing your story um, who are you and why do you create? How did you start making? Um, what do you make and what do you want to do with the funding? With impact, you're talking sometimes just about impact on yourself and in other cases it might be impact on, on your community, impact on other audi artists, impact on audience or participants. And viability, that's sort of the logistical side of things. So you're looking at a work plan, um, having a backup plan. So what might you do if, if you don't get the funding? And just to touch on that, to say it, you can apply for 100% of your project costs through Northern Arts. You don't have to have other funding sources. In the North, that's not always, it, it, it's not always possible to find other funding. Um, there's, there's also space in that section to talk about your experience working on, on projects and funding. You will have to provide a budget. So there's two pieces to that. There's our own budget form and then there's space for you to create your own to explain some of the details. Like how did you come up with your artist fees? Where did you find your supplies co supply costs? 
Um, and lastly, one of the most important pieces of an application, and I would say in, in most OAC programs, support material is really important. Because the assessors are artists, they love to see a little bit about what you do. It might be, you know, that you're including um, audio samples of music that you've you've recorded as a musician. It could be exhibition um, photos of exhibitions or photos of your artwork, um, videos that you've created if you're a filmmaker, examples of writing if you're a writer. So those those pieces of the application are are crucial. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and give yourself time to gather that material and to, to upload it into the system. And just to add, it's very helpful if you're working with other artists on your project to also have samples of their work with their consent as well. Um, support material is also a great space to have things like letters from the community, uh, letters from other artists who, who can speak to why the project you're proposing to us is, is important for you. Um, those kinds of things go in support material and are, and are very important. Um, and just to note that I'm here to support folks, uh, particularly people in the north, but if, if I am someone you feel you can reach out to, please do. Uh, even if you're not based in the north, I can connect you to, to people, other folks at the OAC, and I'm more than happy to do that. Um, I, I know there were a couple questions that came in just um, as folks were registering. So I think I talked, one of them was, can you apply if you're based in the north? Um, no, not to this program. I think I touched on that, but but there are other programs for sure uh, that would that would fit your activities. Um, the next question was, who's the perfect fit for your program? And I was thinking about this, and I was like, I don't know. Obviously, you should be from the north. Then I was listening to what Elder Cat was saying during the opening, um, and about about speaking from the heart. And I think that those kinds of projects with any OAC program are tend to be what assessors gravitate toward. There has to be balance in that. There needs to be detail as well. You have to kind of have thought things through and know what you want to do. There has to be some clarity. But things, things that are coming from your heart, um, thinking about what is speaking to you right now, what is it you've always wanted to do as an artist, those, those are the kinds of things that you should be applying for. And, and, that's, that was my thought there. Um, I'm just seeing a question here. So there's, uh, as a solo artist who employs about four other musicians to create my music and projects, can I apply it to the groups category? So I'm not sure if that is for more, it could be for Mora. I suspect so, Alana, so I'm happy to. Okay, to so I, I'll just thank, ahead, thank everybody. Yeah. I'm done. Um, I will thank, thank you all for listening to me and throw it back to you, Maura. And if folks have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Great. Thanks, Alana. Um, yeah, so as a solo artist who employs about four other musicians to create my music and projects, can I apply to the groups category? As an individual, no, you would not be. Uh, uh, individuals would not be able to apply to the to the groups category so if it if it were really appropriate you you know could formalize your group into and by formalizing i mean give yourselves a name and uh the the critical thing is for collectives in general at the oac um you you need to be able to cash a check in the name of your group so um uh, yeah, we always write the check out to whoever the applicant is. And so if the applicant is the ABC group, that's going to be what goes on the check. So that is the one um, consideration when you're thinking about a, applying as a group that you need to have a bank account fundamentally with, with your in your group's name. So that's something to think about. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else there, but I think that's the answer. One thing that when Elena was talking that I, I don't think I emphasized, um, she's absolutely right that in almost, well, in probably all of our uh, 
okay, I'm just going to go back because it's, I do have a bank account uh, with the name of the group. So that's great. Yes, then yes, you can. <laughs> you can do that then. Um, so yeah, is, it, when Alana mentioned the importance of support material, your artistic support material, yeah, absolutely. Obviously at the Arts Council, that's what the, it's the most, uh, what people are most wanting to, to, to see is, is what your art is, whatever that is. Uh, and that is one of the really strange things about the Arts Response Initiative, because we're not thinking about your art, really. Um, we care that you're a practicing artist or an arts group, but we actually, in some ways, as strange as this sounds, don't really care whether you're a writer or a dancer or what kind of dance you do or what, you know, um, we are, we are, we're caring about what, what your barrier is to, that's stopping you from practicing the way you want to or need to be doing. Um, so in fact, there is no artistic examples in any of the categories for the Arts Response Initiative, which does feel a little bit strange, uh, I think both for, for us and probably for you, uh, not to be sharing your art, but it's because it's, it's, about, it's about something else that program it's it's about uh, the, the problems that you're having the logistics that that we're going to be hearing about so I did want to point that out okay I'm a visual media artist does the program for individuals fund equipment and yes I'm sorry I didn't intend to to mention that that in the individuals category uh, again it's a four thousand dollar grant you can uh, up to two thousand dollars of that can be spent on equipment and software uh, in the other two streams it's up to five thousand dollars so yes are there any other last questions okay In that case barbara i will just say that yeah just please do if you want to have a look at the website at, at the different categories or the different programs that we have at OAC. If really what you want is some funding to help you create a new body of work that, you know, there are other programs at the OAC that support that. So do do look around. Um, there is another question. Yeah. So I understand that the funds for this program have been redirected from travel programs. I'm sure with such multidisciplinary applicants, this will be a competitive program. How much is available in total? Yeah, it will be, you're right. <laughs> it will be a competitive program. Unfortunately, we know how much need there is out there. So um, uh, so in total, there's $1.6 million for this program. Thanks, Okay. Mara. Yeah, great. Thank you, Maura, for answering. And thank you, Elena, for, for that information. And thank you for all the participants who, um, who shared questions as well. Um, so, if that's it for the questions today, again, you could reach out to Maura Atlanta later, um, anytime. But to close today's session, please join me once again to in welcoming our elder, Kat Krieger. Hi there, um, and thank you. It's, it's really awesome to see how much support's in place or how much funding is available and, and the, the difference in kind of applying for these things. I, I was given some wise advice one time when I was doing, uh, I love photography. And I was told that the, the business of photography is about 10% photography and about 90% business. And I thought that was pretty interesting way of looking at it because there, um, there's just so much to do and yet, I see all through this that there's uh, recognition that not all of us are um, proposal writers or uh, skilled in that. And that to open those doorways in the ways that you have is I'm sure appreciated by a lot of people. But um, closing, I, it, it's almost a strange word right now because we're opening so many doors, the idea of doing a closing, um, maybe just, uh, uh, see each other off on our separate ways on our journey. And I always like to light a little bit of sage um, j just to help in that. And again, I wish I could share this with everyone. Um, it's a little bit difficult, but again, I, I, I like to think of the idea that, that spirits, um, uh, spirituality doesn't recognize physical borders. Um, uh, I guess that's part of that concept in that system. 
so I'm, I'm sure we're I'm sure we're reaching everyone and maybe it's a time just to take a moment and uh, look back into our minds look back into our hearts and to see all the things that we've shared today and as well the the importance of what it is that makes us an artist what it is that makes us somebody who helps an artist and that there's a um, the things that are put in place to help us along that pathway they're like trail markers almost this this is the next spot in the trail i need to to reach and, um, here's here's places on the trail that are, are kind of being pointed out where careful where you walk here or step this way or step that way here's a safer uh, way to complete your journey or to start your journey as it were and uh, it's almost like sending people out in different directions for some reason i brought to mind of a, a scene from my childhood um, and I used to live right near the mouth of the Petawa River where it intersects the Ottawa River. As young kids, we would walk out or swim out to this big sandbar. There was a lot of freshwater clams. And one day my friends and I decided we would collect a bucket of these clams with no intent whatsoever other than just to collect them. So we collected a whole bunch of those uh, clams and a sunny, beautiful day, crystal clear water and the sandbar being just a little bit above the, below the surface of the water. And we took that bucket of clams and dumped it in to the center of that sandbar. They love that area. That's, that's a clam thing, I guess. And we were standing there talking, watching the sun and, and you know, as young people laughing and joking. And we started to notice that all the clams had started to move as clams will very slowly, off in all these different directions. And their pathways were clearly visible in the sandbar as little singular trails all going different places. We started to speculate where were they going and, and what was in the mind of a clam. Uh, and I know this sounds sort of silly, but what was in the mind of the clam uh, that it picked a particular direction? And realizing also um, as, a, as a small group of uh, youngsters that we actually didn't know what these clowns were thinking, what was the purpose of their journey, or why they chose that particular direction, but we figured there must be a point, there must be a reason. And beyond us bringing them all together, I guess, um, I, I guess the knowledge that we brought them to a point, a place, um, for the start of a journey, and that uh, they knew what they were doing, they knew where they were going, and they knew why they had chosen those directions. So I'm not sure why that connection come up in my mind, other than um, if you pip, picture the sun on the water, um, picture that age that we're at where we're very young in understanding or, or not understanding, um, the breeze going by, the sounds, the water noise, the rapids just upstream from us a little bit, where these two giant rivers um, meet. So it was, I'm not sure what the metaphor is there or why, why that comes to mind, but it seems uh, at this point important to share. And maybe that's like a, a, you know, a group of artists gathering where we meet together in the center and we all have different ideas, different thoughts, different ways of doing things, different ways of expressing ourselves, and different goals. And when we set off on that journey, it's, I think it's nice to come together like this. And I see value in, in gatherings of indigenous artists, in this case, indigenous artists. And I kind of look to the future or it'd be really nice to have when COVID maybe lightens up a little bit, to come together as artists, just to share, just to speak and talk and uh, talk about our, our, our goals, talk about our achievements, talk about our difficulties, and be able to share within a venue like that somehow, uh, help each other. It's like a village of people. It's like a a culture within its within a culture almost so it's just kind of a little dream that started flipping in my head I related it back to that day in the summer that I've not forgotten I know when we look back into our childhoods or where we started journey um, maybe there's things that get in the way maybe for the clams those those um, those shelled ones those creatures um, this was an interruption in their journey yet they come together and I'm hoping they had time to share um, maybe whatever it is clam share with each other but I also look forward to a time in the future we can come back to that center we can come back to this fire we can come back as a circle and maybe share how we did with our seeking or our funding hunting um, 
how it worked for us and uh, learn even more from each other from that uh, to move forward. As for closing, um, I find myself uh, almost not able to close things. I, I see it as again as a as an opening, and like that braid. Uh, you know, when you start braiding your hair when you're younger, it's 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 however long it is, and if you allow it to grow, it gets longer and longer and thicker and stronger. And I see what we're doing here is taking a bunch of things, braiding braiding them together, recognizing that there's flexibility in that brain, that braid, but also that it's still attached to us. It tapers off at the end, really small. Um, it, it has that all the thoughts and things that we put into it, but it, but it is strong. And I like that too. Maybe that's why I like to have a braid of sweetgrass close by all the time when I do things and occasionally light it. For myself, when I, you know, sometimes when I travel, um, even in the, in the metropolitan areas, when traffic becomes uh, difficult, when, when things grind to a halt, when there's people who are angry because things are in their way, other people need to get somewhere, um, People are waiting for them at their at their journey's end. Um, I used to just sit in my car, uh, light a braid of sweet grass, and smudge. And I still remember somebody pulling up beside me. It was an elderly woman in a big, beautiful car, a large car. And while I was sitting there, her electric window went down, and she leans out of the car like this and goes, "Thank you. I needed that." I thought maybe. Maybe there's a time when we start our journeys or when we're paused in our journeys to return back to that spiritual side of ourselves and whatever calms us, whatever gives us strength, whatever um, inspires us, that we re remember that uh, the center of that all is our heart, where our inspiration comes from. And all the things that happen along our trail, they are um, just a little bit more to add to our mind, our, our image. I like to call it our image base and what we refer to. I know sometimes, uh, and I go back to, I mentioned a, a Chinese elder who taught me that everything I see, everything that I experience, everything that I come in contact with is something that adds to my database of images. When I think I want to express something, when I think I want to convey something, then I can go back into that database, pull out a particular image or thing or event or sound or combination of all those things. And bring that out as this is what I'm trying to say. This is what I'm trying to get a, give across. And it's in the sense that maybe the, that clams traveling out and leaving their little trails everywhere in the sunshine, maybe that's that metaphor of uh, coming together in yourself. And being, uh, being turtle clam, I know we talk about the shells of the turtles. I know we talk about the turtles have been here before humankind walked this world. Um, I can't imagine how much uh, ancestral blood memory they have, but it must be extensive. And how, uh, you know, the, the 13 segments of the shell talks about the 13 moons within a year and talks about an entire cycle of the year, how each of them is related in that way, and the wisdom and the knowledge that the turtle carries. And part of what I think about that sometimes, you know, I, I've heard people say when that turtle, when something happens, they pull their head in the shell and they hide. And I, I don't actually think about it that way. I think what the turtle is doing is it's pulling itself inward, looking at its knowledge base, looking at all the things it's experienced, uh, seeking wisdom from that, that, those eons of knowledge. And once it comes up with a, a resolution, um, once it decides what it's going to do, then it comes back out of its shell and proceeds. And it proceeds quite well. And it's protected. I like to think of that shell as representing all its knowledge, all its wisdom, all the ancestors. It is protected by that physical shell, but also protected and, and nurtured by the wisdom and knowledge that it carries. So I think each one of us, as we go through life, each one of us, as we pick up all these different thoughts and images, that's, that's what we look inward for. And as artists, I think when we look inward like that, then what's coming out is truly a piece of ourselves. And to be able to nurture and support um, artists in their journey and to be able to bring that out is kind of a wonderful thing. And I, for one, appreciate how much everyone is doing to make that happen. And I know nowadays that often that support is often in the form of genre of, of money. 
that shiny stuff. Uh, well, it used to be shiny stuff. I guess it still is. It's plastic now. It used to be metal. But that uh, shiny stuff that seems to um, be necessary to move forward in our in our uh, our economy in our world. When I was young, I used to look forward to my father bringing home uh, his freshly pressed shirts. So he was a military person, so they would have a military dry cleaner, laundry mat. But when he opened that shirt, inside was a perfect piece of white cardboard, thin. And I used to look forward to getting those and keeping them because I could draw on them. So that was a strange form of government support for a young artist. But for me, that was really important. I think a lot of us maybe have stories like that where we start off with nothing, but we really do have something. We have what's in our heart. We have what we need. We have that uh, mind, body, and spirit that we have. We can always draw out of that. I think when people see how beautiful that is and how much it means, and how much it means to the individual putting it out, they are sharing a gift. I like to think that life that we live, you know, when we harvest plants, sometimes we offer some tobacco. And we, we speak to those plants. When we harvest medicine, it's the same thing. When we take a deer, it's the same thing. We, we speak to them and thank them for giving up their life so that we can, uh, so we can sustain ourselves and move on. And I think sometimes when we show art, it's almost similar in that sense that we are um, showing a life, a lifelong collection of things uh, that we, we, we blend together, we braid together. And it's, it's like saying, here's, here's a part of my life. I want to share it with you. And that's a pretty, um, it's a pretty awesome thing. So spiritually for me, um, that idea of being able to share, that's important. That idea of supporting the ones who want to share, that's important. And each one of our life has impact or intersect, much like those clams. Off we go again. And at some point we may cross paths again. I'm sure we will. And I'm grateful for that as well. So for all of us that are possibly traveling today, I know we're all at home. Some of us will travel a bit. Some of us are already far away. So our words are traveling for us. So let's wish our words a safe journey. Let's wish our hearts a safe journey. And for those of you that do physically travel, I do wish you a safe journey. So maybe when we're all done this, each of us can take just a few minutes to sit quietly and uh, feel that gratitude for what we've received today. And I appreciate all of you that have come together to put this together, that do the work at the, at the council. Um, and, and let's just uh, zoom forward with, with this, this new call, the bison here, the, the funding buffalo, <laughs> uh, if I can say humorously. Um, so everybody enjoy their hunt. Everybody have a successful hunt, a good harvest. And as we come up to what is the solstice right now, the falling leaves moon is coming. Um, take that time to enjoy this, this beautiful, beautiful image that the Mother Earth is going to present us with. So miigwech for listening to my words and miigwech for uh, sharing what everybody has shared today. And I wish you luck as well. That basic one, good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Yawa Gola Kat. Really nice words. Thank you all. Yawa Goa, Miigwech, Merci, and have a great day. <laughs>